Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, my buddy, Pastor Matt Richard, is back. How you doing? It's good to see you, Harrison. It's good to see you, too. Uh, we're recording this uh, the day after Reformation Day, or uh, more popularly known as, as Halloween. Uh, today is is officially All Saints Day, but we'll probably celebrate it on Sunday in most churches. You'll you'll hear this uh, today on Thursday, and, and so that's a whole lot of time and a whole lot of places, and a now and, and a not yet, uh, which is a, a really, really cheesy segue into what I want to talk to you about today. Um Jesus talks a lot about all of the the good things that we are as Christians, and you look around and you don't see them. Uh, and, and so, more often than not, the thing that we do as as uh, pastors who are trying to honestly, I, I feel like defend God more than anything, is, is sort of punt and say like all of those things are true, but you you will see them later. But that makes them feel less true if you don't actually get them until until heaven. So, how do we actually address sort of the the tension between what we see and feel and, and experience now and, and the promises that are yet to come? Like, is it just that we haven't earned heaven yet, or or what? Yeah, you know, we were talking a couple of pastors and I were talking about this whole idea, and there's this kind of idea sometimes where we we can put all the good things of Christianity off in the distance, off in the future, and mm. it's like, well. You know, heaven's off in the distance. Um, you know, eternal life is off in the distance, and and so then we end up being, you know, Christians that are chasing the old uh, proverbial carrot on the end of the stick. We're always um, trying to grab something off in the future. The reality, though, is probably the best way I've, I've I've come to understand this is this understanding of the overlapping aeons. Now, it was like, what on mm. earth? Okay, all right. So, so if you think about, you know. We, we tend to kind of go, well, we got this and we got this, we got A and B. And so we say, well, okay, we're still in this veil of tears and this life that we have. And then here's the eternal life and heaven, the glory to be had in the future. And it's like, boom, boom, boom. And we think, okay, we, which one is it? This one or is it this one? But we fail to realize it's not this or this, but it's like this and like this. Hmm. And they, they overlap. And so we can, at the same time, we can simultaneously say, you know, right now, we live in this veil of tears, which I love. That's how our old old Christians used to talk, this veil of tears, which is this valley of tears that we live within, with all the suffering and struggles and sin. Uh, and so we have that. But at the same time, we also have uh, our baptisms, that we have this assurance that we're baptized into Christ. And this age that we have is going to what? Come to an end. And it's not going to come to an end like this. And then all of a sudden we have a new age that begins that butts up against it. But we have it, what? Overlapping. And so at the same time, we are in the now, but not yet, and they overlap. And so in a sense, we, we already have one foot in the resurrection, as is, it has been said before by other pastors and theologians. So, so we, we, we are 100% children of God right now because we're overlapping. But then what's going to happen is at some point in future time, this veil of tears is going to come to an end. And then the full glory of being what resurrected from the dead and given brand new bodies and all that is going to be fully revealed at some future point. So, so we have it as a down payment right now, and there's more good to come in spite and also in the same time as what the suffering of this veil of tears. Right. It's it's so easy to sort of mark God's absence by the presence of suffering and sort of say like, well, if it hurts down here, it's just because we're not actually in, in heaven yet. But uh, there, there's so many places where our, our Lord promises the kingdom of God is is at hand. Like not the kingdom of God will be there as soon as you die and don't really need it anymore. But like, you know, after you're done hurting, then God will come near to you. But but rather, he draws near to the brokenhearted present tense. Um, I, I think one of the biggest issues with it, the now and the not yet that we kind of struggle with, you're right, because there's this over overlapping thing is, in, in, in the latter, in the resurrection of the body, there will be no more suffering, no more sin, no more pain, no more death. But right now, there is, but God is present in both. Um, and, and the mark of this, it, it's really going to sort of cut right to the quick of where you go looking for God. Um, so some theologians will talk about this in the, the theology of the cross or the theology of glory. Uh, some will talk about just sort of where do you find God and, and sort of recognize like the danger of, we call it enthusiasm, sort of looking for God in the feel goods of your heart um, or how much you're getting done in your hands of pietism. We've got all these fancy words for it, but are you looking for God in the places he's promised to be on the cross? suffering with you, for you, in, in the font of baptism, uniting you even now to a, a, a rescue, to, to the Lord's Supper? Or are you looking for God in sort of an escape from the things you don't want to bear? Because a God who actually bears the things you don't want to bear isn't a God who's far away from them. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've said this many times, and, and, and I, I got to preface this, but there, most of the time I don't wake up in the morning and I don't wake up feeling like a Christian. 
In fact, if somebody would say, what does it feel like to be a Christian? I would say, I, I really don't know. Uh, this, this idea of, of, of feeling what joy or feeling happiness, I should say, mm-hmm. feeling happiness. Most days I'm, I'm not happy. You know, I just, I, uh, you know, my, my wife says I'm an absolute bear in the morning until at least I get my cup of coffee, my first sip of coffee. And then, you know, I, I have a little bit of happiness there with my coffee, but most days I, I'm not happy. And, and, um, you know, maybe I'm a little, as my daughter would say, dad, you're a little melancholy. She's not melancholy. She goes melancholy. She goes melancholy. She says, dad, you're melancholy. And which is true, you know, and, and that, that is so, okay. So then why is that? I think perhaps part of it is just because this veil of tears, um, you know, and, and, and I'm not trying to play some sort of, you know, sob story as, as a pastor, but, but the majority of the people that talk to me are always what's struggling, uh, struggling with things. So I hear the burdens of people, um, all the time. And, and that's, that's actually a great privilege as a pastor that people trust you to do that. Yeah. So then the question is, okay, so if I don't feel like a Christian, then, then, then how do I maneuver? Well, I am a Christian because I'm baptized. And so it's where we anchor our assurance in this veil of tears. Where, where do we anchor our hope? And so, you know, like what you mentioned there too, before God gives us these real, uh, real tangible things in this life so that we may know with certainty that we belong to him, uh, that we're children of God. And that is that font. Every time I go into St. Paul's sanctuary, I look at that font and I'm like, yep, he snatched me from darkness unto, uh, darkness, uh, unto death, unto life. He snatched me from that, from darkness unto life. And then I look at that font and then behind the font, I see the table. And I'm like, and he invites me, he invites me, the chief of sinners. He invites me to come sit at that table and to receive his body and his blood. And then he pours the absolution into our ears. And then he preaches the word into our ears to let us know that I'm, I get to be in the ark of the Holy church where I'm safe uh, 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 in that ark of the Holy church in spite of the chaos in this world. And so God gives us these tangible good gifts uh, not that we can just dream of or like, you know, I wish I can't wait to open the gift, but these gifts that have been opened and given to us uh, that we can, you know, as one pastor would say, we can hang our body on, that we can hang our whole life on. And so, yeah, I, I don't often feel like a Christian. I often don't feel happy, but I know I'm a Christian because I'm baptized, because Christ baptized me, that he feeds me his supper, and then he says I'm forgiven. And so we anchor ourselves on what Jesus says in the midst of, well, this veil of tears. And it matters all the more when you got the the melancholies, when 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 you are hurting, when you're sad and suffering. Um, I, I think more often than not, our, our goal whenever we come across somebody we care about who's hurting is just like, I'm going to fix what's wrong so you feel better. Make me um, happy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and there's some things broke can't be fixed. There there's some things that are just going to leave you sad. But but the answer to that is is not actually like you need to change who you are or just you know put on a happy face until you finally feel it. Uh, the answer is not even just to to knock this problem out so you're happy because that's pretty fleeting. Something always tends to come along and chase it back away. It, it's it's a reminder of a present identity. Um, it, it's it's um, it, it's so cheesy, but um, I I, I got to go to Eeyore uh, from you know the the great classic tale of, of Winnie the Pooh, who's just he's yeah. always kind of he's down, he's sad, yeah. um, and like there, there's no actual fix in that uh, particular thing. There's always something right. that's that's got him. But what what actually is is beautiful about it is is he's always surrounded by friends who remind him that he's loved, who remind him who he is, who remind him that he's valued, not because things are going the way he wants or even because he he is what other people would expect him to be, uh, but but rather here. Uh, you you got to chase this all the way through. Um, you do not have a God who who sort of waits for you to to put on the happy face and then gives you what you have named and claimed in your prayers. You, you don't have the God who who da- sort of dangles happiness on, on the other side of if you just fix all your problems by, by obeying the law. You have a God who is constantly there to speak an identity to you in word and deliver it in, in sacrament uh so so that no matter sort of how you feel uh you can be reminded who you are because that's actually when you really need to be i need yeah. to be reminded when i to, that i'm loved when i'm hurting not when everything's great um and so if everything's falling apart around you that that present identity of who you are you are today a child of god even if you don't fully see it yet it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with your identity it just means that that it's not time to to see it yet yeah you know and i'm is your is your sharing here it's Excellent stuff. But thinking about uh, what what does Paul say to Thessalonica? He says, you know, one of my I Winnie the Pooh story with the Bible, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah. he goes, well, he goes, because I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, uh, to grieve as people have no hope. Yeah. Um, and so in other words, he's not saying to them, saying, you know, when you grieve, he's, he's not saying, hey, knock it off, Thessalonica. Stop being so sad. Be happy. This. Have hope. He's not saying exchange your grief for, for hope. He's saying in the midst of your grief, have hope. And so again, it's 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 this at the same time. 
And so that's the same thing with, with funerals. When we have funerals here at St. Paul's, I encourage people, you know what? You have sadness. Um, and that's good. That shows that you cared for the loved one. If no one was crying, then I'd be concerned. But you're crying because you, you love this person. And you can also be angry that maybe their time was, quote, unquote, uh, cut short, per se. Um, and you're going to have these full range of emotions of what? Of, of, of anger and tears. But in the midst of those angers and tears, have hope. The hope of Christ, the resurrection at the same time, simultaneously. Uh, right alongside your grief and your, um, you know, your your, your anguish and, and uh, anger at the same time. And why? Because right now in the present context, which it goes back to our whole point on this, is that we are children of God right now, present tense, uh, in the midst of this veil of tears. And that is going to see us through. And so even if we find ourselves in death, guess what? We're still a child of God. And that's the whole point of All Saints Day. We don't have two churches. The church has departed and the church that's still present. We have one church, which is in Christ. Uh, those that are living and those that are departed, we're all in Christ. We all belong to Jesus. We're all children of God. And we all await, whether it's here right now in the present, ti- present tense with the beating heart and the body, or whether we're what? Uh, our bodies buried in the grave and our souls with Jesus. All of us are still awaiting what that that present day when when the full manifestation, the full glory of, of renewed bodies in Christ and the resurrection is going to happen and be transformed into the likeness of Jesus when that happens. So we all await that with hope, um, in spite of the circumstances uh, of life. Absolutely, Pastor. Thanks so much for the words of hope. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Hey, right, thanks, Harrison. Good stuff. Have a good one.